Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you all ask the questions and we answer. I am joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, Kristen Williams. Hello, Laura. Hello, everybody. I'm looking at your beautiful new haircut, and I really was at a <laughs> loss for words to describe, but my gorgeous Farrah Fawcett uh, hair-like co-host. I, I feel like a new woman. It's like, I don't even want to put my hair up. Alas, I know. When, it's important. Once I have to wash it, it'll be a whole other story. I know. That's the problem. They they blow dry it out and you're like, oh, this is amazing. And then it's like, how did I ever, how can I ever <laughs> I do that? Like how can I ever <laughs> give it? All right. We got a lot of questions with pain and discomfort. Uh, so we'll start with licksboard.tofu. Woke up wrong, have a sharp neck pain around the left mid-neck area whenever I breathe. Mm -hmm. Any relief? Oh, this is the worst because this does happen to me, not necessarily related to when I breathe all the time, but I will sleep on my neck wrong and you wake up and it's like, I mean, a sharp pain, usually on one side or the other. Um, what I have found helps the most. I mean, Laura, I've had you work on me before when I don't have the able hands of a, of a good friend or physical therapist. I have always treated myself with movement. And believe it or not, let's say if it hurts to turn left, I will turn left all day. I'll try to, adjust, I'll try to mobilize that joint myself. Um, not necessarily pushing into excruciating pain, but just kind of taking it right to that, you know, if it's, if it's side bending, I'll take it right to that feather edge of where it hurts and then just keep going there. And I, you know, watch my posture, drawing my head back in space. I open up my upper back, especially if you're talking about it, correlating with the breath. I wouldn't be surprised if there is something going on. It could be suboccipital all the way down. Those suboccipital muscles from the base of the occiput, they go all the way down to the between the shoulder blades. So, you know, mobilizing your upper back. So take a yoga block and lie over it. You can clasp your hands around your neck to kind of support your, your cervical spine while you arch back over it. You can lie over a foam roller in a pinch. I'll just flop over the back of my bed. Um, to really open up that T-spine, because sometimes, who knows, you know, you woke up with the pain, but I would be curious what you did the day before. Had you spent more time, in it, let's say, at your desk, or maybe you took a long road trip where suddenly you were sitting a lot, and you were more static in your upper body, in your pelvis. So open up your T-spine, mobilize the cervical spine. So mobilizing, meaning going into rotation, going into side bending, um, you can even, you know, do some soft tissue release by getting your fingers back there right along, you know, you kind of palpate along the back of the spine. Those are called your spinous processes. If you come right off the side of those, that's kind of the gutter. And you can just sort of get in there and find if there's any soft tissue restrictions. Um, as you turn, you can assist that spinous process with rotating further with your fingers. Um, what I find nine times out of 10, if I don't have someone to, to help me out of it, it is through movement um, and mobilization. And then ultimately, once it gets feeling better, I start to do some stabilization stuff. But it all boils down to, I think, restoring posture and full range of motion. What else do you do for that, Laura? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I was traveling and my son FaceTimed me, which is like, you know, my daughter FaceTimes me every day, but my son's FaceTiming him. I'm like, what? I answer it. He goes, oh, mom, my neck, my neck is bothering me. I was lifting weights yesterday and he woke up and it was that thing. And it's, that, it's this thing. Whenever you feel like there's like this sharp, pinchy compression and, it, and it'll be sharp because um, to Kristen's point, some part of the those processes are, are like a little torqued and that can happen overnight just sleeping. But it might have happened like when he was weightlifting and had his head in a, in the not best position. And and so I, I did I told him all those things. I said, get your fingers in there and just start poking around. You might feel like some tension, some you might even feel a little bit of the bone sticking out. And just move your fingers into it as you lean the opposite way. And then lean, you know, lean to the direction um, to Chris, like what you were saying, in the way that it doesn't feel good because you're, you got to, and then add some side bending and some rotation with it because you're just trying to kind of bring it back into place. This is what's amazing is you don't need somebody to do anything major to your, it, a couple of moves, um, and it might take more, it might take all day to do those, but like to your point, I totally agree. Like you have to move it because it'll shift back. 
uh, if it's torqued a little bit. And yeah, then start working on thinking about what it was the day before or the the months before, like at your desk, if your head is forward and down and then you sleep like that, all those suboccipital muscles are really tight and then you add a little bit of a turn and it could have, it might just have pulled on those spinous or um, transverse processes during the night. But they will return, they, but you then you have to do the job of working on posture to make sure it doesn't happen again um, because there's imbalance around the skull, imbalance around the cervical spine. It will keep, it'll, it'll come back again. Um, and I don't mean that like in a like warning way. It's just that'll happen because there's imbalance. Um, but the good news is movement and postural restoration absolutely helps. And then really well, I just, love that you pointed, yeah. sorry, I, yeah. I love that you pointed out um, your forward head and then you go and you do the same thing in bed. That's it. You kind of reminded me that when my neck is bothering me, I will pay attention to how I at least go to sleep because I will find, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> have my head super fun because I'm, I'm like reading my book and I want it sort of hanging off the edge of the bed. I will, I'll find my triple S in my, you know, and I will get my pillow just right, at least to start off the right way. Yeah. Or when I'm, I like to walk the dogs and read my book, I'll hold the book up straight ahead of me while I'm walking the dogs, you know, as opposed to constantly looking down because I just know where I might find myself in my regular daily life. I might as well not do it when I can, when I can make the change. Consciously think about it. Yeah. 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 It's really true. And, you know, someone else asked, um, Maria Gonzalez, this is just piggybacking off this. What pillow do you recommend for neck pain that radiates up the scalp and top shoulder? This is Mm -hmm. all part of the same stuff. And, you know, I'm going to really continue to recommend Canuda, K-A-N-U-D-A. Um, it is, game changer. And there, I know it when I'm not at home and I don't carry it with me. I know some people, it's just like, I just don't travel with it, but I can tell the difference because it's too, like the pillows are too squishy or too firm or they just tilt it. And the canuda are made by a physical therapist. They really cup around. And if you lie on your back, they're great, but you can also lie on your side and it doesn't um, shorten that one side because it's this perfect, like, memory foam designed ish thing. So you can go and get a Canuda pillow and use lit 15 and save. Um, they're, they're expensive, but they're worth it because again, if you're sleeping and you're spending half of your, half of your life sleeping, essentially you, you should sleep, you deserve it, right? You should deserve it. So, okay. Next question. This is from a Miori. A Miori asks, Feeling low, what do you and Kristen do when you're feeling unmotivated to move, work out, slash do your daily thing? That is tough. I mean, motivate. And and we are active people. So um, I am definitely, I, I think I'm abnormal in that sense that we've talked about this before. We both like exercise. It does feed up, feed us. But I absolutely might have some times where I'm feeling unmotivated to move or to move in a different way. And what I've always found is um, setting a goal. So for me, it might be running a a 5K or it might be, um, you know, doing a challenge like people doing our six week challenge. You know, when you give yourself some structure and give yourself a goal, that, that really, there's just something satisfactory, in my opinion, to checking a box. And so whenever I have felt unmotivated to do what I want to do, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm active for work, so I'm always going to be doing yoga, but, um, or I might make up a flow if I feel like I just need to move, you know, I need something to stimulate me, but getting on a program, doing a challenge, doing training for an event for me has always been been a motivator. So that's, I think my personality, I, I have always been someone who does better almost when I'm busier, you know, like if I have to fit something in, that's like, Oh, all right. You know, I don't know. I'm, I thrive on filling every minute of my day until sometimes I burn the candle at both ends and I'm like, get sick. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, um, I think for me, it's a schedule. What about you, Laura? What do you do? Well, I'm a little, I am like you and the sense that, um, I, I thrive on a schedule and, and, you know, let's be honest, our, our life is crafted around movement, which I'm, I 
I'm thankful for every single day, every single day, because um, it what you do during your daily life in terms of your profession, in terms of your hobbies and habits is is going to be that uh, thing that that can that is easy to do, right? It becomes a habit. And so for me, um, if I had that mo- like unmotivated feeling, um, I sit with it, I, but I know from so many years of doing the habit that it um, that even a little bit of movement will help. And so this is the first thing I'll say is that if you're not like Kristen or I, that we're where we just like we're made where we it's part of our just we have to do it for work and it's part of our cycling. I would really um, invite you to think of movement as not a um, not something that is detrimental or punitive, but is some m- movement is life. And I think in our modern day world, we think of fitness, wellness, movement, and sometimes we think of this as something we have to do. We have to do it to fit in our genes. We have to do it to you know stay in shape. And there's a light, there's a punitive kind of ethos around it. And I think when that is present, it's much easier to f- like th- the flames die out and then have this relationship where it's not so positive, where when you're like, oh, I'm not motivated to do that. There can, we're all going to be unmotivated. We're all going to lack energy. We're all going to lack enthusiasm. But if we have in our, in our brain mapping and habits that this is a reward, actually. Movement is a reward. Movement is a gift. Movement will change you. But it doesn't have to be like a check off the box, It does like how we do it. It can be, you know what, I'm feeling low. I'm just going to move a little bit for five minutes mm-hmm. and really observe the shift in how you feel. You might not feel all the way great, but I guarantee you're going to feel a little less low or unmotivated. So that would be my, my other thing is because recognizing that not everybody is like us, either that we don't. You know, we have this as part of our profession, and that was planned that way because we knew we loved to move and loved. But if you have this kind of, uh, you know, little tug of war with fitness, with wellness, with movement, and it's and it's some somehow got a negative impact in this kind of punitive way, just reframe it. Movement is life. For anything to change, it has to move. So you can change your mood, and it doesn't have to be like go out for a five-mile run. It could be get up, roll your shoulders, do some head hinges, take some deep breaths, walk down the street and back, and guarantee you'll feel different. So I think it's it's all of the above. Have it in a schedule if that works for you, but make it a habit that works mm-hmm. for you. So if you have it in your schedule and you aren't doing it, that's when it becomes a negative feedback loop. So you want to always create this. This is a positive feedback loop. Movement is a gift for us, and we just need to remember that and not be punished by this idea of what we should be doing. Well, I think that um, probably one of my favorite things about being a physical therapist when I, you know, was working full time or even you know almost almost full time in, in a clinic and seeing people regularly is seeing that change because this is what will happen. Once you make it a habit, once you get on that schedule, nine times out of 10, if not 100% of the time, people feel better. And so when you get that positive reinforcement of all of a sudden, wow, if I would just do this every day, I would feel better, that helps to sell it. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes people getting into pain and having to go see a physical therapist or, and honestly, my ultimate goal with, with my patients was, I don't want you to rely on me. You know, like I come see me, I will help you get in the habit because I'm your accountability. So another thing you can do is find an accountability partner, you know, get someone that wants, you can find someone that wants to do it with you. And there is joy in that, you know, um, I'm, I'm a solo workout person, but I loved going to in-person classes because there's that camaraderie, you know? So that's the other thing. Um, I think once you feel better, you can, it's nice to have that accountability to start, but once you start to reap the rewards of just feeling better from movement, hopefully it becomes a habit and you become more like you and I who recognize how good it makes us feel. And we just don't feel as good if we don't do it. Yeah. 
And the final thing I'll say to that is I, I'm really good at resting too. Like mm -hmm. I take, and it's not long, it's just like some people might take 15 minutes to move. I will take 15, 20 minutes somewhere in my day, most days, to just rest and be still. And either I do like a crossword puzzle or I read or I don't do anything, but I'm, and that is like a rejuvenation and that allows me to continue to have my, but that energy. Um, so I think we also need to value like when our bodies do truly need to rest. And the thing is when you are in, in tune, those, those will become more in tuned as well. Like you'll want to move and then you'll want to rest and you'll know when. Um, so I hope that this helps you motivated. We all have these moments of not feeling it and it doesn't have to be big. Just get up and do a little something, a little something, put on some music that always helps five minutes of your favorite oh, yeah. tunes. You will, it'll change your world. <laughs> all right. Our friend, Chris Metz. She has been recently diagnosed with cerebral stenosis. Is this a, quote, bad, bad diagnosis? Uh, and what should one focus on? Well, I'll just tell you uh, before you, maybe you can describe a little bit about uh, stenosis. But what I told her is, listen, it's a diagnosis. And it's kind of unfortunate you got it. Because I, I don't want to say it like that. But diagnosis can them can be actually one of the most detrimental things for people because then you are, I don't want to say consumed, but very focused on it. And so everything, every little signal you get to your brain, you might interpret it because you're in this kind of stress state. You're going to interpret it as something terrible. That being said, anything around the cerebral spine, I get that it's, you know, um, a cervical spine, I get that it's like a little scary, but can you first tell everybody who doesn't know what is cervical stenosis and what are some things to not worry about and what are some things just to pay more attention to? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are really two areas that we will get stenosis in the spine. We will either get it in the central canal, which is where the spinal cord goes down. And then the spinal cord has a branch off at every level called where spinal nerves come out. And there's a little um, hole, this foramen that the nerves come out. You can also get foraminal stenosis. So there are two types and I don't know if our friend Chris, you know, let us know which one she had, but it's neither here nor there. It's a narrowing of that hole. So you can imagine, I mean, think of it like a, just like, um, when you're threading a, when you're threading a needle, if it's got a really nice big hole, you can stick that thread through with no problem. If it's got a narrow her hole, you know, you're licking the thread. You don't want like any, <laughs> you're like squinting. Yeah. It doesn't give that thread, i.e. your nerves, as much space. And so it can happen as a result of, you can have a disc that bulges and the bulge will come and impinge upon the foramen as the nerve goes out. You can have some, um, a disc bulge that will bulge backwards towards where the spinal column, spinal cord, excuse me, comes down. You can have bone spurring. So we've talked about bone spurring, some arthritic change where then the bone will encroach upon that. And then you can also have what we call spondylolisthesis or a shift of the vertebra one on top of the other, where if you're looking at it on YouTube, you know, the hole gets smaller because we shift the spine and that, that foramen and the spinal canal will, will, will decrease. With that being said, to your point, Laura, they have done studies. They will pull a hundred people off the street who have no pain and they will find arthritic change, including stenosis in the neck, absolutely in the neck. I and mean, we start getting arthritis in our neck in our twenties and thirties. So try not to be attached to the diagnosis because just because we see that on a scan doesn't mean it correlates to symptoms. Now, most likely Chris has symptoms because she or he went to the um, doctor and got this scan and they found this. But a lot of times by freeing up any other place along the chain where that nerve goes down, restoring posture, don't forget uh, MRI and x-ray is a snapshot in time 
any cases of your posture, because if you're lying in that MRI machine and your chin is lifted, well, you're in cervical extension because you have maybe some restriction of your suboccipitals and some forward head. Or if you're standing and they take a picture and you're in forward head, well, all of that is going to create stenosis, I'm putting this in air quotes, around the nerves because of the position you are in at that moment. So really learning how you can move better, how you can posture better, how you can restore mobility to free up those nerves can be the difference between pain with stenosis and no pain with stenosis. So again, kind of unattaching or detaching from the diagnosis is step number one, I think. Yeah. And that's basically what I told her. I said the same thing. Like I might go an MRI and see the same changes as well. And she does have some numbness and tingling and that is what led her to get that. But um, I think the thing that is important to focus on for anybody out there who is like weight bearing on their head or, you know, we don't do that. Like that's definitely not something you want to do because you're compressing um, the cervical spine. And if you've got anything already happening in there, especially if there were bone spurs, I don't ever want to get anywhere near the bone spurs, but you want to just open up, you want to open up space. You want to open up space um, on along the axis and then along between the different vertebral segments where those spinal nerves might be coming out. And that again is posture, 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 getting, I, I mean, my gut is going to tell me there's some you know, lift of the shoulders and or rounded forward. There's something happening in the in the head, and and I'm sure that is the case. So, Chris or anybody that is dealing with any kind of cervical spine diagnosis um, that has this kind of narrowing or impingement in the nerves, you know, that's what we would do is we would try and traction you, would try and give you some more space, and then really work on the postural training, work on getting the the upper lift of the ribs so that you're not kind of um, pushing them forward and maybe with a forward, you know, it's like the whole chain, you've got to look really from the ground up, but the, the, like Kristen said, what you were doing in the MRI is really your kind of natural posture. Very few times you're going to like change it when you're lying there. So I guess the main thing is don't overly focus on the diagnosis, but be really aware of what, you, how you're sitting, standing, sleeping, um, and continue to get mobility uh, without any kind of weight bearing, which I know she's not going to do anyway. Yeah, All I right. Huh? Yeah, I was. Yeah. I said a private with someone who actually was doing a, a, a yoga handstand and broke her neck. So a handstand, um, a headstand, headstand, me, head, headstand, Ooh. and you know, heard it, felt a crack. Ended up having to have a cervical fusion. So there you go, friends. Ooh, <laughs> yes. We anybody that's listened to us long enough, there is no reason to do that. Don't don't put weight on that head, that beautiful Oops. cervical spine area. Well, thanks as always. These are great questions. Uh, remember to write us with any questions at support at lityoga.com. Or you can reach us online on Instagram. We can be DM'd at Laura.hyman or KBWilliams99. That's also a great way to uh, reach us. Yeah, we love, 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 love hearing from you. And we would also, of course, love it if you subscribed and rate and review because we love to hear that as well. And share with your friends. As always, we are pulling for you. Are pulling for you. <laughs>